Hey, what is going on everyone? Boy, we are just rocking and rolling today, just kicking out video after video. Um, as I mentioned, there is a ton of video backlog. Uh, I've been doing lots of stuff. There's um, new gear to talk about, but this video is gonna be pretty expansive. It's probably gonna run, I would imagine, like 20 minutes plus because it's going to um, have footage and, and knowledge from over like three days where I spent time in the Mammoth area. So if you've not been to the Mammoth area, it's part of the Sierra Range. Um, just a beautiful place. I love going there. It's uh, restorative to the soul. Um, if you can't be at peace and if you can't be, you know, just calm and tranquil there, you, you ain't got it in you, okay? So uh, anyways, put your hard ads on and uh, we'll get the learning on. So to begin with, if you're not familiar with the Mammoth Lakes area, Okay, I'm going to give you kind of like a bird's eye view of the entire area. So this is the western coast of the U.S., California, of course. I'm going to zoom in on the area of interest. Okay, so over three days, we spent time at Rock Creek Lake, which is one of these backcountry, well, yeah, kind of backcountry lake over here. Uh, Lake Mary which is around here but really I think most of the knowledge that I picked up on is gonna come out of Crowley Lake which is here now Crowley Lake I've never thought of Crowley Lake as you know a must-go destination because it just wasn't as beautiful as some of these backcountry lakes but after having kayak fished that lake I now understand the allure of that lake from a fisherman's perspective. So I'm going to give you some you know, information on how to fish that body of water too. Okay, so we are going to begin our journey at Rock Creek Lake, which is again one of the higher elevation lakes. I think it sits at like maybe 9,000 feet of elevation. So if you follow my channel, you'll notice that I am on a new kayak, well, a new used kayak. So this kayak is um, a pedal driven, like a bicycle pedal, you know, drive system. And um, I'm gonna have to narrate over this video because the wind was just oppressive. As a matter of fact, the wind has been the bane of my existence the last couple of months. And I think you'll find that if you watch kayak fishing related videos from the West Coast the last couple of months, I think the wind has been really kind of problematic for for most people you know you'll notice that they'll all make references to just the cruddy wind but anyways um, some of the benefits of this kayak okay so instant reverse is the big deal okay so I, I've not ridden it enough to be able to say yeah this is definitively faster than the Hobie um, but certainly it is more capable more versatile okay so let me just kind of go over some of the benefits of this um, pedal driven system um, the big deal is basically the bottom line is it gives me instant reverse okay that's the big deal so um, I like taking video footage as much as I do like fishing right so with the old Hobie kayak I can only go one way and that's forward. So if I'm trying to capture footage of someone landing a fish, I would have to make circles around that person. And it was just kind of annoying. With this kayak, the, uh, the big advantage is I can just come to a screeching halt basically and kind of hold my place using my feet, whether it be pedaling forward or pedaling backwards. Um, some of you will probably know that I'm a big bicyclist. So this biomechanical motion is going to make more sense to me. Now from a fishing perspective, I think there's one huge benefit of the instant reverse. Okay, so I'm not an engineer, so some of this is guesswork, okay? So as you all know, the transducer will shoot out a circular cone, and when it hits the floor of the lake or the, the sea, it's gonna look something like this, right? So if you are pedaling along and you see something or you start to, you know, come upon something at like, let's say 2 o'clock or you come upon something at like 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock, it's all going to represent the same on your Fish TV screen. Okay, so 
going back to the old hobby, if I, you know, come across something at, let's say, like 2 o'clock, okay, I'm not really sure which way I need to circle, okay, but I do know that I, I do have to circle, okay, because it, because I don't have reverse, if I just stop pedaling, I'm just going to go right past it, right? So, again, if I hit something at 2 o'clock and I just make a random decision to circle back to my left, I'm probably gonna, you know, miss the mark and I'm gonna have to hunt for it again, okay? And sometimes, if it's a small mark, I flat out will not be able to find it, okay? So, now, if I hit it again at two o'clock and I just randomly choose to turn right, okay, then I'm probably gonna be okay, right? Now, if I hit it at 12, again, you know, I'm gonna circle this way, I'm gonna have to hunt for it, okay? If I circle this way, I'm gonna have to hunt for it. With the instant reverse, okay, it doesn't really matter whether I hit it at 10, 12, 2, I'm just going to stop, okay? And then I'm just going to make fine adjustments and figure out where, you know, this spot actually is. I think that's the key benefit of having instant reverse. That's a big deal. Okay, another subtle but key benefit, especially in kind of like a lake situation like this, is let's say you're casting something very very light like a Thomas Boyant or maybe like a Panther Martin so what are they like maybe an eighth of an ounce with a lot of um, surface area right so trying to cast something like that into a stiff wind like 20 25 miles per hour is going to kill your casting distance but that was the only way I could do it with the old Hobie because I would have to put the nose of the kayak into the wind and cast into the wind otherwise I would you know quickly be pushed off the spot okay with a kayak that has instant reverse basically you do the opposite right you put the wind at your back okay and then you're pedaling backwards to kind of stay in place and when you cast you're going to have that 20 25 mile per hour wind enhancing the distance of your cast so huge deal um, in that scenario Another new toy in my arsenal is a touchscreen fish TV. So I picked up the Garmin, what is it, the 73SV. So this model um, has the touchscreen. And in the past, I was a little bit worried or apprehensive because like, I was very proactive with the fish finder, right? So if I'm catching fish or uh, handling bait, and then I'm touching the screen, then I might leave like a film or whatever that might be kind of annoying. But the reality is the screen kind of cleans up pretty easily. And the other reality is some of the stuff that you want to change, some of the settings are like four or five levels deep. So um, in the end, I think the touch screen absolutely does make sense and it is better than the old school um, push button. Okay, so let me quit yapping about gear and approaches and then kind of get to the fishing portion of the video. Well, for this lake anyways. This is just a drop shot rig. This is a um, three pound liter little, uh, what do they call these? Like Amberdeen hooks or something like that. And with the worm, I don't really like threading them multiple times. I just like to thread it one time to keep it more natural. Then a little quarter ounce sinker. And um, you know, I'm just paddling along, marking fish and then dropping down vertically. Okay, that in and of itself is kind of like rock fishing. Okay, in this footage, you're gonna see what I'm going after. So I'm not going after the garden variety planter trout, which might be like in the one pound range. And before I forget, let me keep it 100% real, okay? How many fish you catch is going to be largely dependent upon the planting schedule from DFW, okay? If they've recently planted the lake, you're gonna catch fish, whether you're a really bad fisherman, whether you're a really good fisherman, I mean, there's going to be some variance, but it's going to largely determine whether or not you catch fish. If they've not planted the lake, then you're going to struggle to find fish or catch fish, especially the planter type. So these fish on the screen that you're looking at, these are not planter trout. These fish are ginormous, okay? Now, I've not caught these fish, but if I correlate the size of these arches, to the size of the fish arches in the ocean that I have caught, I'm gonna have to guess these are like mm, six pound plus. 
and a six pound plus trout is a huge trout. And I'm targeting these guys, and this is my rig going down right here. Okay, let's give it our best shot. It's gonna be kind of tough because these fish, they're not stationary like rockfish. So I'm using a live counter reel to try and get the bait to where I think they are. So right now they're marking it around, what, like 45 feet or something like that. And so this is tough. I mean, this is not like ocean rock fishing. It's gonna be tough. Rig. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, nipple? I think I got something. Yep. But it's not a big fish. Ah, oh, it's a little fish. Gosh darn it. But, you know, I think the methodology is probably, I think, on point. So, this is going to be going to be a beautiful little um, brookie, I think this is, and this year is a little bit like last year because they haven't been really able to plant much because I think that bacterial infection has come back, so I'm trying to see if we can let this guy go. Yeah, this is so interesting, okay, so this is my rig, I'm marking fish here, and this one fish came up to have a look-see, but he wasn't interested, so um, again, marking fish and catching fish are two different things, but it's a fun game, isn't it? Okay, so here let me take the time to give you my interpretation of what I think is happening underwater. And again, I'm not an expert, so maybe this is all just guesswork, okay? So we're in about uh, 60 feet of water. I'm marking fish at around the 50 foot mark. And this is my rig. So I've sent my rig down to about 45 feet. And these, these fish TVs are pretty amazing, okay? You see this little hump right here, okay? That's me jigging the, uh, the rig, right? So I give it a little jig and then I release the, uh, the spool, send it down another two, three feet. At which point this lunker comes up Okay, this fish is interested enough to come up, uh, you know, a couple, three feet and take a look at my rig. But in the end, it decides, thank you, but no thank you, and goes back down to the bottom. Um, tantalizingly close, um, but, you know, these fish become big by being smart and not by being dumb dumb, right? They're not going to randomly slash at any kind of shiny moving object like like rockfish and that's how they grow to be you know five six eight pounds so god bless them <laughs> so the fish tv i think the greatest benefit by far is it basically keeps you from wasting time where there are no fish okay it's not about like always finding fish it's about not wasting time in unproductive areas. That's the real benefit of a fish TV. So anyways, in the end, um, I wasn't able to hook up to any of those U-boats, but um, one, of these, one of these days, I guarantee you, I'm gonna hook one of those. Um, it may be a matter of going to some kind of a live-ish bait, as my friend mentioned. It may be a matter of waking up at 4 a.m. or staying until, you know, uh, 9 p.m. Something extraordinary. But one of these days, I will hook one. Wind's, wind's forecasted to be like gusting up to 40. And I've had my fill of wind. So we're going to fish from shore. Got a kayaker out there on a pedal kayak. He just hooked up. We saw just a bruise or like just swimming like 15 feet offshore random duck we're gonna try a little casting with the um the thomas buoyant the red and gold and we shall see all right here we go and this rod is so beautiful okay i'm not a great caster but this rod allows me to be a good caster. Seven foot light St. Croix. 
not even that super expensive it's like 100 bucks man love this rod so that kayaker is hanging out here for a reason you know he has a fish tv mounted so i think we picked a pretty good spot like spoons or lures or whatever you want to call them I think it's a little bit like dropping down on something vertical rockfish typically within like a handful of casts you'll know if you're at the right spot and if the fish are in the right mood are you marking fish nice nice kayak so he yeah I, looks like he's vertical dropping on top of him. So I'm gonna cast toward the, the kayak. The wind is like picking up now, so gotta keep the cast slow, you know, line drive. Here we go. Okay, so this is like cast number Ten or something like that. I'm a little bit worried because these Thomas Blunt hooks are not very sharp, so sometimes they pop off. All right, let's get some underwater footage of this guy. Watch me lose this fish. All right, so we're just gonna release this fish. And that, you know, that's one of the benefits of fishing artificial is because they're just easier to release, you know, mostly unharmed, so I like that. And he's foul hooked anyways. Calm down. There you go. <laughs> Look at his cadence. That's a man with intent. He's saying, put on a fucking pot of coffee. We're about to put in a 14 hour shift. You know what I'm saying? We might hit the jackpot here. Okay. This might be a two-hander, right? Don't try this at home. Do not try this at home. Two-hander, oh, wow. Okay, gotta make sure I have the wind at my back. Okay, here we go. Oh, winner, winner. Okay, so the third day was spent at Crowley Lake and this is probably where the rubber meets the road if you're here for like fishing tips. So Crowley Lake is hard to miss. It's right off the 395. You exit and then um, there's going to be a kiosk like right around here and then this is also where they will inspect your kayak. So again, uh, word of advice, call ahead, ask them, hey, what are the protocols for uh, kayak inspection? Um, it's probably like 10, 20 bucks to get in. Make sure your kayak is bone dry. Assume that they will open your hatch. If they find any water, you will probably get turned back and that would be a shame. Okay, so after passing inspection, you drive down and in this video, I launched from the boat ramp, but I only did so because it was a Monday, okay? And it was kind of light in terms of traffic. What I would do 
especially if you get there on a weekend what I would do is instead of launching here I would just drive my car down here unload the kayak you probably won't even need your your wheels and then after unloading come back here and park your car and then you're off to the races and then once you launch I'm gonna give you some macro level tips I'm gonna kind of tell you where we found fish I'm gonna give you the lay of the land in terms of the lake um, so first of all I would describe uh, Crowley Lake is kind of like a big expansive lake but not very deep so you know I paddled pretty much around all these areas and I th think the deepest water I saw was maybe around like 80 feet or something like that so it's a pretty expansive lake so let me give you some measurements so if you launch from the marina and then paddle to let's say Sandy I think this is Sandy beach or sandy cove or something okay so that's two and a half miles okay but um this lake like many other lakes that are kind of in that area in the valley it does get windy and i will um show you that in video footage so you got to be aware of that i you know i keep beating this like a dead horse okay so if you're planning to roam all right always understand which way the wind is going to be blowing when you are tired and you want to come home okay so in my case the wind was in my face and pretty heavy as i was paddling out and that gives me a little more um leeway makes me a little bolder because i assume that i'm going to have a tailwind when i'm coming back um in terms of where to fish okay we found um all the big trout like right here this is called Hilton Bay okay um, don't take my <laughs> word for it there are all kinds of downloadable maps you know PDF format for Lake Crowley it's a very popular big trout destination okay so here Hilton uh, Bay is where we uh, found all the big trout um, we paddled here this is called uh, McGee Bay and um, this is called Perch Flats for a reason. This is called Sandy Flats. Um, not much happening here, not but much happening here in terms of trout. But I'm assuming if I go back and af after having learned what I learned, I'm assuming that this is called Perch Flats for a reason. Uh, launch a kayak it's pretty straightforward uh, the people who are working the entrance and the whole outfit very friendly and you'll understand why they're getting like five-star Google reviews so obviously drive your car right down here really simple I mean I would suggest of course with any venue get here early but piece of cake so I guess we're gonna post up at a place called Hilton Flats. I mean, boats are hanging out here for a reason. Uh, fish finder is not showing much, but I don't think trout are quite as structure oriented as like bass or other fish. So there's a reason they're hanging out here. And there's also a reason why I'm the only kayak fisherman out there. Um, again, please do as I say and not as I do. I'd hate for someone, you know, especially if they're kind of new, to be looking at my video and thinking, well, if this jackass can do it, so can I. Um, maybe, maybe not, okay? So I gotta tell you that I'm an accomplished jackass, okay? I've I've had a lifetime of jackassery, so I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of good at it, and I can get away with some things that other people might not be able to get away with. Just like you might be good at something where you know I, I would completely flop. Okay, so you should not you should not you should not be out in these conditions. My friends are anchoring up, and so you might be wondering like, hey Voodoo, why don't you anchor up? And um, my spidey senses tell me that I do not want to be anchored up in this slot because for me, uh, it's critical that the boat moves freely and then my hips are loose so I can deal with this. 
and I do not want to be anchored up at one point where the boat and my hips cannot move freely. I mean, I need that freedom for stability, I think. So on the fish TV, here's what I'm seeing as I'm kind of um, paddling about. And when you're in new water, it's always, I think it's always a great idea while you're traveling to the point, uh, the destination point, you might as well be trolling something, right? So anyways, on the fish TV, what I'm seeing is bigger fish. And it seems to me that with the trout, the bigger fish more or less kind of hunker down to the bottom. And then the smaller fish with the trout they appear to rep in a certain way so unlike bass that are more or less stationary and pelagics like barracuda or whatever that are mostly you know like straight line somewhere in the mid column trout to me appear to spend more time going up and down up and down i guess you know foraging for food or whatever so trout will often kind of rep as like longish question marks like like this so instead of an arch like this they'll rep like this like this so these diagonal streaks i think are you know not small trout but bigger trout kind of going up and down the column and now we come to an absolutely tragic portion of this adventure okay so <sighs> the imagery you're looking at is um, the imagery after I had just released a beautiful lunker of a trout. I mean, this trout was probably like four or five pounds, okay? I was trolling a lipless Rapala, I guess like crawfish. Let me show you. That guy, okay? And... Um, as I was paddling along and by the way these lipless crankbaits have a tendency to run lower right they're they're kind of weighty and they'll run lower so I'm trying to hook one of those lunkers on the bottom so I hook one um, take my time I'm narrating through the entire process um, I'm running like four pound liter so I'm uber careful I do a great job um, tiring the fish out Okay, this fish barely, and I mean barely, fits inside the net, <laughs> okay? So, um, you know, I, I net the fish, and I'm super careful not to even touch it because trout are not like bass, okay? Trout are fragile fish. You, you can't just, like, you know, manhandle trout. And so if I mean for a trout to go away mostly unharmed, I won't even touch them. So anyways, um, I... I thought I was taking video. I throw the uh, the trout overboard quickly to get him back in the water, and then I hit my GoPro. Okay, and then I hear the tragic sound of three beeps. Okay, and with the GoPro, three beeps signals that it's it's starting to record, not ending, but starting. And so um, this is the aftermath of me releasing that beautiful trout and I'm just it was a tragic comedy and I'm still kicking myself over it so in any event um, we caught um, trout and the allure of Crowley is that no trout that we caught was under two and a half pounds so every trout that we caught was somewhere between like two and a half and three pounds all of them and so that is the allure of Crowley Lake. So when, you know, when the fish planting is kind of like sparse, Crowley's probably going to be one of the top lakes that they plant. And typically they plant them with big trout, you know, like uh, two, three, four, six pounds. And so and that's why I was mentioning if your intent is to go chase big trout, then Crowley Lake is probably where you want to go in this area. Doing what I like to do the best, which is just scout and roam. And I get to scout and roam in beautiful scenery like this. This is so awesome. Absolutely stunning. 
So after that, I set my focus on trying to find the Sacramento perch. Um, because if I ever go camping with kids or whatever, I can put them on these fish. They're supposedly not very hard to catch once you locate them, okay? So uh, I spoke to a guy at the marina who told me that he had caught, like he and his wife had caught like 91 of them. He didn't keep them all, but he caught 91 in one like session or something like that. So um, because I had never um, been to Crowley before, um, I just basically, I, I knew they were shallow water fish. So when we were in Hilton Bay, I kind of focused in on like some kind of vegetation, brush piles, things of that nature, but I couldn't locate them. But this is before I knew that this area was called Perch Flats. And then also the guy that I spoke to who like who knocked 91 out of the park told me that you can also find them here at Sandy Point. So I'm gonna have to apologize here. I wasn't able to wipe off all the tears after losing that, that big trout. But here I'm kind of demonstrating the difference between the traditional 2D sonar, which I use almost exclusively in the ocean, okay? So what you're looking at is the traditional 2D sonar, and this is what a weed bed or you know vegetation looks like in about 13 feet of water on a Garmin unit. Now I'm going to roll the film and then at some point I'm going to switch over into the clear view there. Okay. So for the Lawrence people, this is your down view. And I think in this scenario, this setting, I think the um, clear view or the down view does make more sense because you can obviously see what is the lake bottom and then what is vegetation here whereas in the 2d it's not quite as distinct so i think this is a case where the the clear view does pay dividends so with only about two minutes left in the game i'm basically back in the marina as you can see in about nine ten feet of water and um, I'm just kind of hoping to still locate the perch, okay? So the chartreuse stuff you see on my thighs, that's a Berkeley crappie nibble. So I'm using basically a little, you know, like 1 16th ounce jig in, in about 10 feet of water. I'm just kind of basically just jigging it up and down, you know, like it's basically a Hail Mary before I have to go in to um, the, the dock. Here we go. Okay, so that's what they look like. Back on a perch. Fun. All right. So finally. Okay, so you, so you can see I'm <laughs> like right on the dock. I have no shame. Okay. So this is what they look like. Sacramento perch. Um, I hear they're pretty good eating, but I'm not gonna keep any fish today. I'm gonna let this guy go. Um, I think if we just handle them like this, it's fine. And then I think once you like find them, they're not that difficult to catch. Okay. All right, so back to go. And then, as you can see, I'm like right on the dock. So, um, you know, to me, fishing is fishing, right? So, if you have kids and you want to keep them entertained and occupied, uh, you don't have to go very far. <laughs> Okay, so if I were to uh, summarize Lake Crowley from the perspective of just someone who wants to get out, do a little paddling, and have fun, and not necessarily chase trophy fish, okay? And, and I'm not judging anyone, okay? So you, you determine what's fun for you. So if you just want to have fun and you're with family or kids or whatever, 
I would probably, um, uh, if you want to catch fish, maybe rent a boat. Uh, if you're into kayak fishing, you know, again, launch from the same place, the marina. And I would probably make a beeline for here, which is called Perch Flats. It's a little bit of a paddle, okay? And again, the wind is always going to be a factor. So from here to here is probably going to be about two and a half miles, okay? Um, and the wind might make it feel more like seven. But once you get here, um, the, the guy at the marina told me that the key for the perch is water temperature because you have to realize uh, Crowley Lake is in 6,500 feet of elevation. Um, so some years it does freeze over. So the key temperature, they're very much like crappie. The key water temperature is 60 degrees or, or something thereabouts. So as the water warms up, you know, like in the 50s, 55 or whatever, they begin coming into shallow water and staging in the weeds um, in about 10, 12 feet of water. And then once the water hits that magic mark, they come in even more shallow and they do their spawning or whatever. And then after they're done spawning, um, they go out to deeper water come like, you know, July, August, and then they will suspend. Okay, so they'll look for like maybe 30, 35 feet. This is what I was told. And then they will suspend maybe on top of vegetation. So on the fish finder, you won't be able to see them necessarily because they're, they're embedded in the weeds. But, you know, right around like 60 degrees, just, you know, drop stuff down in about 10 feet of water, you know, and then once you locate them, again, not very hard to catch a whole mess of them. Okay, so long video and it's finally coming to um, a wrap. So um, thank you if you've, you know, stuck around this long. Please, whatever you do, do not hit the like button. Do not subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> okay um anyways get out there have fun be safe and we will see you soon on our next adventure bye for now